hi everyone and thanks uh thanks for coming just making sure um everything's working apologies there's some uh road road works going on outside so if uh, if any of that comes through on the audio i i do apologize uh, thanks for thanks for joining us uh today hi morning morning laura who just uh, posted in the chat uh please do everyone contribute in the um in the chat we really want a nice interactive webinar today it's going to last about 45 minutes to to an hour there's a q a box in addition to the chat so please do input any questions that you've got as we go rachel and i will both try um to answer them uh, as we go but if we don't we'll come to them um, at the end uh, as i mentioned my colleague frankie is going to share a feedback form right um after the webinar is over it'd be really great if everyone could take a chance to to fill that out it's really helpful for us in planning the future webinars improving the the format and making sure that we're covering topics that's that's interesting for for all of you so really appreciate that Ooh. great so today we're lucky enough to be joined by rachel salt who's the coo of even break they a job site that specializes in connecting disabled candidates with inclusive employers and between rachel and i today we're going to cover everything from the benefits of hiring people with disabilities um, how to get your employer brand out there and how to build an accessible assessment process so i'm going to get us started by introducing instant impact and doing a little bit of a scene set um, and uh, and then i'm going to hand over to rachel before um finishing finishing up with the with the assessment process so for any of you who haven't heard of instant impact yet uh, we are in-house recruitment specialists we work with our clients to build the function that they need to reliably bring the best talent into the organization and the most diverse talent into the organization. We also help them working as their in-house team to successfully execute recruitment strategies. Now, I hardly need to tell uh, everyone here the amount of change that businesses have had to undergo since, since March in particular. In, in our world of recruitment and talent, the two major changes have been a shift towards remote working during the COVID pandemic and an increased momentum behind diversity and inclusion following the Black Lives Matter protests. And it's the intersection of these two changes that presents a really unique opportunity for businesses looking to hire more candidates from neurodiverse and disabled backgrounds. And I'd just like to explore that in a little bit more detail. So firstly, we're undergoing a time of change that's unprecedented in most of our lifetimes. So companies are re-examining the way that they look at talent across the board. Do our employees need to work from the office? Uh, what kind of skills are we going to need in this new work workplace um how can we keep our our culture and values alive in this in this new world and as companies are asking and answering these tough questions in 2021 we're really expecting to see a period of sustained change which is really exciting so secondly Although HR have long been driving an agenda of improving diversity and inclusion, it's really become a board level concern following the Black Lives Matter protests uh, earlier this year. And most companies have started by looking, uh, they've started looking at how they improve their balance of ethnic minorities, uh, gender and, and sexual orientation of the three that we hear the most. And at the moment, there aren't as many companies looking specifically at improve, uh, improving how they hire disabled and neurodiverse people. And it's really important that we change that. After all, it's a massive issue. One in five people of working age have a disability. And, and as Rachel is gonna tell us later, I'm sure they're significantly underrepresented in the work workforce at the moment. And we haven't seen a lot of significant change over the last decade. So finally, there's been a monumental shift towards uh, remote working, as we all know, as we can see uh, being remote at the moment. Um, many companies are planning on becoming remote first. Others are adopting a mixed approach, so offering the flexibility to work from, from home or from the office. But even companies that are planning a full return to the office will have realized how effective a remote team can be. And this can have a huge knock on benefit for uh, disabled and neurodiverse uh, people in the workplace who may have found it difficult to commute or to or to work in a busy work environment, for example. So all in all, I, I'd say that we've never had as good an opportunity to make change as we do now. And that's the context that I'm going to hand over to Rachel with. And bear with hopefully this will be a slick transition between yeah. slide decks. We've, we've got to do a little uh 
a little flip over there. Hold on a, sec a second. Right. How's that going? Can we all see that? Got it. Yep. Okie dokie. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Felix. Yes, I um, I am the CEO of Even Break, and as, as Felix said, we help disabled candidates and organisations to find each other because one of the reasons it was set up was because organisations said to us, well, disabled people don't apply for our jobs, and disabled people said, well, we don't know which ones are actually accessible. So what I'm going to do with this presentation, I'm just going to quickly cover... Um, some 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 good housekeeping some good practice if you like we're going to touch on the business case um i'm going to reassure you about some of the myths that uh, that people have about employing disabled people uh we're going to have a look at what the barriers are and we're going to have a look at how to remove them so i'm going to start off talking about language so the us i don't know if we've got any us uh, people here uh, they use person first, so they say person with a disability or candidate with a disability. In the UK, uh, we tend to prefer the social model, so we say disabled person. The social model basically says, I am not disabled by the thing that is my impairment. And interestingly enough, impairment is the right word, but I absolutely hate it. Um, I am disabled by the bits of society that don't allow me to be on a level playing field. So for example, a wheelchair user would be disabled by steps. Uh, I am disabled if there are no subtitles on a television program. Um, and what tends to happen is people tie themselves up in knots and they think they might say the wrong thing. So actually what happens is they don't speak at all and it all gets terribly ooh, horrible. So what we say is, if you're not sure, ask. Actually, just say to somebody, how do you want us to talk about your, your impairment? What do you prefer? You know, a lot of people now are sharing pronouns. There's a great deal of debate in uh, particularly the neurodiverse community where they're saying, I don't like being called autistic people. I am not neurodiverse. I'm this, that, and the absolute key is just to ask. And uh, Felix touched on this, and I have to say, if you are not doing disability, you are not doing diversity. Nobody fits in one pot. You know, nobody fits in one silo. I am a white woman. I'm a deaf white woman. I am a wife. I am a mother. I'm a nana. I'm, I used to be a drummer. I am a parish councillor and I absolutely love putting song titles in PowerPoint presentations. So what you have to bear in mind, 83% of disabled people acquire their disability. They are not born disabled. So I started to go deaf when I was 24. Um, another one of your, your uh, team members may have sadly some of them may may end up suffering from long covid uh there may be in a road accident there is you know there's there's no planning there's no accounting for when you may or may not become disabled so basically include everyone if you look on twitter obviously i spent a lot of time on disabled twitter um there are so many uh individuals who fit in lots of different lots of different silos so you can't do diversity and inclusion if you are not doing disability as well. Um, as, as Felix said, um, the disability employment gap is it hovers around 30 percent. We've had a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of an improvement, but it's not significant. And there are some amazingly talented candidates out there. You know, we've got. We've got candidates who uh, have um, one, for example, runs a team of volunteers who do a wind turbine and, and they built it and he's blind. Um, there's just, I, I could get very, very passionate about this, but there's some really, really great candidates out there. So because you're on this webinar, I am guessing that you already realise there is a business case um, for attracting disabled talent. 
So for a start, you're reaching a wider pool of people who wouldn't normally actually apply for your roles. Um, and they've all got loads of different experiences that they can bring. So for example, if you are looking for um, an accountant uh, and you attract, you, you, you let the disabled community know that you're looking for an accountant, there may well be an accountant in that pool who is A, a really good accountant, but is also really good at things like problem solving. They can bring a different set of perspectives. They've got different experiences. So, you know, if you've got a, an individual with mobility issues or you've got an individual who perhaps uh, has a vision impairment and they're traveling across London using public transport every day, trust me, that person is really good at planning ahead and problem solving. Disabled candidates are just as productive. Um, if you use things like speech to text and other bits and bobs like that, I can speak a lot faster than I can type. So, you know, there's loads of fantastic software out there that helps candidates to be just as productive. You can see uh, as I'm talking, the subtitles are being auto-generated by the accessibility tools in PowerPoint. You are going to be having candidates that know about accessibility tools that can help the whole of your organisation. Um, disabled candidates, much better retention for two reasons. One's a good reason, one's a not very good reason. Um, if you make a workplace adjustment for an employee, they are necessarily going to feel valued. They are going to feel um, that you care about them, you care about their experience. And actually other people in your organisation are going to see that you are a reasonable employer and that you will make adjustments and that you'll help people to do the job to their best of their, the best of their ability. Um, the less good reason is that because not many other employers are necessarily as good as you guys are going to be, uh, people say, well, I'm going to have to stay here because I'm not going to get a job anywhere else. And it approves to morale. I mentioned about if somebody, uh, if somebody sees that an organisation, if you're making reasonable adjustments, then it makes them feel good about about your company and I think anybody that's worked in an organisation where there is um, there's a diverse workforce will will vouch for the fact that it does improve morale. Um, I always put this little point in about fewer workplace accidents um, because Jane when she talks about this, Jane is the founder of Even Break, she, um, she talks about the fact that she has a very, very fragile back and spine, and if she falls, it would be absolutely disastrous. But um, she can get tipsy and not fall over because she knows what her limitation is. And similarly, you know, if I'm in a car park or a warehouse or something like that, I am very mindful of what's around me because, you know, if, if I step out in front of a vehicle or something like that, it's a bit of a nightmare. So one of the things that we get a lot of pushback uh, for is when people say, oh, well, you know, I've, I've got all these things that I'm worried about. And so I'm just going to bust a few myths for you. And the first one, the most important one is we know, especially in the, in the situation as things are at the moment, you are going to be getting a lot of applications for roles. And um one of the fears is that you will get a lot of really unsuitable candidates um i can tell you now that's not true uh you won't you may get a couple of extra candidates and um, they will have all of the skills that you're looking for and then perhaps some of those extra ones that i spoke about but disabled people are absolutely brilliant at self-selecting you know i'm really really good at a lot of things but I am not going to go for a job in air traffic control, nor a call centre. You know, I know what my limitations are. So what we tend to do is we look at a job description and we kind of go, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. Oh, I'm not sure about that. I probably won't apply. So when you get an application from a disabled candidate, generally they know that they can do the job standing on their head, assistive technology allowing, and that and they will bring those extra skills. Uh, you won't have to pay for expensive adjustments. Access to work 
I mean, clearly, if you have a completely inaccessible building and you want to take on a team of wheelchair users, then there is going to be some, some financial outlay. But generally, disabled people have all the tools that they need in order to live their lives. So you may have to get a slightly different chair. You may have to get uh, a different monitor. But generally speaking, access to work will pay for them. So I'm going to use Jane as an example again. Jane can't drive long distances, so access to work pay for her to have a driver. So when we go up to an event in, say, Birmingham, her driver will come and pick her up, and then he'll drive her up there, and that's all paid for by access to work. Um, disabled people don't actually tend to have a lot of time off sick. Um, that's because we're used to possibly going to work and feeling a little bit not so great and because a lot of the organizations who have embraced disabled employees tend to be more flexible we can kind of adjust things around so one of the ladies i follow on twitter she was saying oh, do you know i've just realized i've been in my job for 18 months and i've had two days off sick because what happens is if she has a day when she feels really poorly or you know she might have a migraine or something so she'll go back to bed until lunchtime and then she just moves her working day and it's something that we do very successfully at even break as well we don't say to people your set days are this 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 and this we say here are your hours here's what we'd like you to get done do them when you feel that you can do them um this this particular one we don't have any jobs that disabled candidates can do is is one of my absolute favorites um felix mentioned that one in five people uh, of working age have a disability it is likely if you are a large large organization you already have disabled people in your organization doing jobs but they've not disclosed because they're really worried that they are going to be seen as less or not as good um, it's not our job to decide which jobs disabled people can and can't do. Um, if we have a we, we keep a, um, a sheet in our office of all of the fantastic people with amazing careers who have disabilities, who have, have hidden disabilities. And there's a media perception of the sort of things that, that people can and can't do. Um, so <laughs> I can't stress enough very often we as individuals will kind of go uh, well maybe they won't be able to do that bit it's not our job to do that the candidate will tell you what they can and can't do and we have never ever found a job on our website that no disabled candidate can do um, and this is the biggie this is the one that you really need to pay attention to disabled people already know we're an equal opportunities employer because of course everybody is supposed to be an equal opportunities employer but what we're going to find out now when i talk about um what we found with our research is that disabled candidates just don't so we commissioned some research with ucl in london and they spoke to just over 700 candidates and 82 percent of them said finding a truly disability friendly employer was a barrier because their lived experience is that once they have disclosed or once they have sent an application form and they've asked for something they don't tend to get shortlisted and for whatever reason but when you are a disabled person, very often you will internalise that as to be, oh, it's because I'm not good enough or it's because I haven't, um, my application wasn't great or they found that I'm disabled, they've decided that I'm not going to be good enough. And so there's this constant weighing up of, well, I could do that job, but I probably won't get it. And they're probably not really truly disability friendly. And one of the ways that they rule themselves out of jobs is that there is a lack of information in the job adverts. And so they kind of go, well, yeah, no, uh, it doesn't really say about, uh, you know, the information that I need. And so I'm not going to spend three hours on a beautifully crafted application because they're probably not going to employ me anyway. Um, candidates rated employers very poorly in terms of empathy. That doesn't mean they were unkind. What it meant was they didn't completely understand requirements. So for example, if I decided that I was going to do 
uh, a hot desking policy in my organisation. Um, I might think that that was the best thing since sliced bread because 99% of the people in our organisation wanted to hot desk. However, for me, that's a nightmare because if I don't get a desk where I've got my back to a wall so the sound can bounce off the wall and I stand more chance of hearing and I don't jump every 30 seconds, that's a nightmare. If you have a neurodivergent candidate, they may well, or employee, they may well want to work in the same place all of the time. And you'll find if you keep moving around, their performance will drop. Uh, and I know that Felix is going to talk about the recruitment process and how, it can, how we can stop it letting candidates down. So moving swiftly on, now we've done all the bad bit, now we're going to do all the good bit. So how to attract disabled candidates. And actually, creating the environment is really important. Um, but don't create it without disabled people. Um, disabled activists have a saying, nothing about us without us. Um, and that's because even my experience of my disability will be completely different to another person with exactly the same hearing loss. Everybody. Everybody will have a view on it, but you can't fix absolutely everything before you go, right, okay, now we're ready to start attracting disabled candidates. You can create the environment, you can talk to your staff networks, not just your disabled staff networks if you have them, because as we've said, nobody fits in just one silo and you may have quiet people in your organisation who are actually disabled. And so getting feedback from them about what you did well and what you did not quite so well is really important. And in much the same way as people at Glastonbury put a big flag up over their tent so their friends can come and find them again, you do need to prove that you're inclusive. So um, if you've got DNI pages, you know, make sure that they're full of information, make sure you've got case studies in there. If you've got any disabled employees who are happy to talk about what it's like working for your organisation. If you've taken part in any schemes, so if you're on the disability confidence scheme, put the badge on there. You know, we have a view in even break about the, the efficiency of that particular scheme, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, if you're part of the Valuable 500, if you are part of organisations like the British Disability Forum, or if you advertise on a job board like Evenbrake, tell people about it on your DNI page. So when they come to have a look at your organisation, they can actually see, yes, this is the organisation for me. So we've got uh, what we uh, it's based on Jane's second book so Jane's written two books the first was the business case for employing disabled people and the second is sort of the how-to um, so we've taken some of the information from the how-to and we've created a, a, a job advert checklist and some of these points you're going to sit there and go well this is just so obvious you know or we already do this I'm not absolutely not trying to uh, teach you how to suck eggs but it's surprising you know we look through some of the adverts even on our board and there's crucial information there that's missing that would would really help um, you to attract more disabled candidates um, so the first uh, and, and I almost feel daft saying this but the first one is actually being specific about salary because disabled candidates are used to you know qualifying themselves out if there's no salary information generally speaking the assumption and I don't I think this goes for all candidates as well certainly for me when I was looking for uh, another role if there's no salary information on there you kind of oh I don't know whether or not that's a step up or a step down or a step sideways and I appreciate that very often you know there will be a range but something as simple as that and the second really, really simple one is address and postcode data. And again, this is not just for disabled candidates. If you are somebody who suffers from anxiety, um, or if you're somebody who suffers from uh, claustrophobia or, or any kind of um, it thing where it would be a problem for you to get from one place to another, if you've not actually got your postcode data or your, 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 your location data on there, 
you will actually find that people kind of go, well, it just says Birmingham. I don't think I can get into the centre of Birmingham or it just says wherever. Uh, so it's, again, really, really simple, but it's such a quick win. Um, another thing that appears on our job advert checklist um, is, is it's things that you probably think that you would cover in an interview. But if you don't put them in your job advert, then you're never going to get those disabled candidates to interview stage because they are going to have probably disqualified themselves. So things like whether or not you offer flexible or remote working, whether or not you've got an accessible building, whether or not you know about workplace adjustments, if there's a, a, a network, an employee network group, whether or not you've got um, uh, healthcare, all of that sort of thing. So all of the things that you think you might talk about in interview, actually, if you want to get more disabled candidates to the interview stage, then it's a really good idea to put that information um, on your adverts. And the other thing is role profiles. So for example, do you really need a driving license? Jane can get to Birmingham without a driving license. You know, if I need to travel, there are other ways that I can travel. So you will disqualify people who may not have a driving license, but actually is it really part of part of your part of what's needed? And when you look at the role profiles, just actually properly think about what absolutely it is that you need because with job carving, yeah, and we do it again in even break, we've got some people who are good at some bits and they prefer not to do the other bits. And so we just sort of we move the work around. Uh, to make sure that we deliver the best service that we can with the person who's in, in the best, best position to provide it. I won't go on for too long, Felix, but this is really important. So if you're not using an organisation like, say, Instant Impact, who, who understand this business case for um, employing more disabled talent, more di neurodiverse candidates, what happens is actually your candidates face an additional barrier. So if I, for example, I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll use my personal experience. So I put my CV in and I get a call from a recruitment agency and they go, oh my God, your CV looks fabulous. Can we put it forward for this job? And you go, yeah, sure, no problem. Just one thing, I can't actually use a telephone because I'm deafened. Oh, right, okay, no, that's fine. And then you never hear another thing from them again. So okay I'm not going to make that mistake again so you uh you put in your CV and somebody gets in touch and you go wow your CV is really great can we have a phone call and you go well actually I, I can't really use the phone particularly well because uh, I, I'm deafened so um can we do a zoom call because I'm really good on zoom because I can lip read and it'll be great and then you never hear from them again so then you put your CV in a third time for another one to another agency and they go, um, your CV looks great, can we have a call? And you think, I'm not falling for this one again. So you go, yeah, sure, no problem. And they are in a call centre and there's a load of background noise and they talk to you for 10 minutes and they come off the phone and they think, God, that woman's a moron. Because, of course, uh, you're doing this dance all of the time. And I'm not even getting to the to the point where I'm getting to the actual employer. So if you are using a third party supplier, you need to include them in your plans for diversity. And Felix is going to talk more about explaining the process and, and how you can get it better. But some some candidates will swerve away. Um, a cheeky little cheeky little pitch here for, for even rate. But yeah, if you advertise your jobs where the candidates are, you will get more. And I did say that I like to put song titles in my PowerPoint presentations. So candidates and team members, you know, if you if you take this, these things on board, you are creating a recruitment process that allows people to bring their authentic selves. And it's not just disabled candidates, it's your whole team. Your whole team are going to benefit from, you know, better staff morale, inclusive workplace. It just, yeah please. <laughs> Employers, now you guys benefit obviously because you're getting more candidates, they are, they've got the skills that you want and a few extra ones. You've got that improved retention. 
you've got the morale, you've got the accident, but crucially more and more organisations are stopping sharing their best practice with each other, which they used to do a few years ago, because studies have actually shown that companies that are inclusive are more profitable. So whereas before, if we had a networking event, organisations would be chatting, I mean, ours do because they're all lovely, but people would be sharing best practice, but now that is company confidential information because it's giving a commercial edge. So, you know, things will start to change. Um, I've got some free resources for you. I've got a copy of the UCL research I can email. Uh, we've got our checklist for creating more accessible job adverts. We don't do high pressure sales at even break because what we actually really want to do is get more brilliant candidates in. Uh, so we won't be, you know, sending you loads of loads of emails. But if you would like these resources, please contact me. Just note that my name, Rachel, is not spelled the normal way. It's spent a slightly different way. And that's me done. I'm going to hand back to Felix, who's going to give you this amazing, fantastic overview of how to improve your processes. Once I figure out how to unmute myself, thank you so much, Rachel. That was uh, that was really, really, really interesting. And I think, in particular, I found, and it, I mean, again, it's it it's not rocket science when you think about it. But um, it's not the the fact that you said that it's not our job to tell disabled people or really anyone what jobs they can and can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, combined with the you know the importance of it involving the disabled and neurodiverse people in your workforce in decisions around the, the the steps that you take it just really rams home the the fact that um disabilities are first of all incredibly complex they're different for uh, as different from person a to person b as their personalities um are and then and then also that it's also a very human experience as well and not yeah. and not a of course, we're all worried about saying the wrong thing, but I'd rather, I'd rather everyone make the changes and offend one person by accident. I'd rather they didn't do that. But the most yeah. important thing is that we start making these incremental changes and we learn as a, as a group as we go. Fab. Well, thank you for hand, handing back. And I just want to take it on from that, from that journey. So you've got a fantastically diverse uh, group of, of candidates uh, with and without uh, disabilities applying to you. And it's really important from this stage that you make sure that your assessment process is, is fit for purpose. And that it's truly, truly, truly accessible and truly inclusive. And there are three elements to this that I wanted to go into. It needs to minimize bias, it needs to be flexible to individual circumstances. And that's, as we just talked about, incredibly important for disabled candidates um, and that it al allows for regular feedback and iterative improvement. So let's start off with minimizing bias. Now, as much as we all wish that this wasn't true, um, as humans, we've all got our unconscious biases and they manifest in a number of different ways. Uh, but I wanted to highlight something called the halo and horns effect. And it's an example of what's called heuristic thinking. And this is where our brains create mental shortcuts that allow us to process the massive amount of information that we take in every day, every second, every moment. Now, in most cases, they're really helpful and they allow us to function without constantly having to stop and think what's what's going on about what to, what to do next. But when it comes to making social and professional judgments, heuristic thinking often leads to what's called unconscious bias. So the halos and horns effect, for example, is where we make unsubstantiated assumptions, positive for halo and, and negative for horns, about people based on other unrelated attributes. So the, the easiest one to, to think about is physical appearance and, and stature. So tall, classically good looking and gregarious people tend to be perceived as both intelligent and trustworthy. A 2004 study from the universities of Florida and North Carolina, for example, found that people over six foot um, would be predicted to earn over 160 thousand dollars more over their lifetime than someone who's five foot five inches um so real uh real uh real life uh, financial implications of of height and the way that that manifests itself for our discussion today is that you can see how an untrained interviewer running an unstructured interview who interviews someone who for example is in a wheelchair or who's unable to make eye contact 
they may well make negative um, and incorrect assumptions around what that means for someone's ability to do the job. It's not, uh, it's not malicious, it's subconscious. So, hang on, there you go. So the way that we deal with that and that we work with our clients to deal with that is that rather than attempting the mammoth and probably unrealistic task of training every employee out of their unconscious bias, we work with our clients to create an assessment process that's both predictive of in-role performance and that creates a level playing field. And so I thought I'd talk you through how we go about doing that. So we use as the basis for our, uh, for our processes a study by Schmidt and Hunter, who are two, two academics, and they ranked how predictive different kinds of assessment can be on people's in-role performance. So the most predictive is what is work sample tests, so tests that simulate the actual kinds of tasks that people will be doing in a job, data entry for a data entry role, speaking on a phone for or, or, or client issues for someone in customer service. Um, and then the least predictive is years of education and years of experience. So let's look at how a typical assessment process might be put together and highlight where disabled and neurodiverse candidates might be disadvantaged. So starting off with CV screening, something that's part of the majority of businesses. It's the first stage of most businesses assessment process. They look at years of experience and education, which are both not particularly predictive. And one of the main things that people look for, apart from what's actually written there, but they look for consistency of work without gap gaps and perfect speller, spelling and grammar. So really easy to see how someone who's been unable to work for an extended period, um, maybe because of their disability, maybe because of an accident, um, how they would be disadvantaged or someone who has a learning disability could be held back by the spelling and grammar um, elements. Uh, telephone interviews we've already talked about, but that's often the second the second stage. And I think Rachel gave plenty of examples of, of how frustrating that can be and how bias um, can, can creep in and how people can be disadvantaged. Um, then the um, next stage that most businesses have is, is a, a structured panel interview, and that can be very uh, predictive. It's usually around key skills, but that's followed by an informal meet the boss interview, a chat over a coffee or maybe some more old school companies over a, over a drink. And that's where the halo and horns effect can really come in. So people making uh, untrained people making uh, irrelevant assumptions based on physical appearance or, or how people carry themselves. And then finally, there's a, a reference check prior, prior to offer. So what we have here is an assessment process, pretty, pretty standard. It's not particularly predictive and it's really open to, to bias. So the way that we'd uh, deal with this is we'd remove the components that aren't predictive. CV screening, references and unstructured interviews. And we put skills and, and predictiv predictivity first. So we can rework the assessment process to start with cognitive ability tests, for example. And there's great technology there that can really make sure that accessibility is, is put first. Um, we might then go to skills-based questions, replacing CVs, and that keeps the assessment relevant to the, to the role itself. Then we have a structured, we keep a structured interview in there and, and best practice is to have more than one person in there, which really reduces the chance of heuristic thinking and the halo and horns effect creeping in. We can then look at live tests or other in work scenarios uh, to test how the, the relevant skills that people have for the role itself. And for any interview, what we do is we create a scorecard to allow an interviewer to really focus on the score, core skills and behaviors that's required from the role rather than getting distracted by value judgments that may not be relevant to performance at all. You'll notice that we've kept reference checks in, in this sample interview structure despite them not being very predictive. Um, and what we usually do is we advise companies to make hiring decisions before the references um, and then use those references to get a better understanding of how to manage the employer how to work with the employee, how to manage the future hire. And then you can always rethink if something terrible or scary comes up in the, uh, um, in that reference check. Now, this example is quite an extreme reworking of a hiring process. This is what we consider to be best in class. Uh, and many, many clients decide to retain elements of it. So for example, they might decide to keep a, a CV screen, but really train their hiring managers and recruiters in, in unconscious bias. So they know what they're, 
what they're looking for, or maybe uh, keep the same principles in there. So removing the the name, removing some of the dates, but using it as a guide to to interview. So as long as you keep those those um, fundamentals, any business can can create a really fair and unbiased assessment process. Now I know that sounds very structured, or based on research and and uh, around best case, but the other element that businesses need to keep in mind is how important flexibility is. So different different people have different requirements as Rachel was, was talking about so far. So it's really important that your business, your recruitment function, your hiring managers, just are mindful to create a level playing field for everyone whilst ensuring that it's a, the assessment process is a good te test of performance in role. And there are a few steps that, that we seem to be really effective and that and that companies can take. I mean, there are lots of steps that, that people can, but I just wanted to suggest a few. So where candidates need to read material, provide an audio and large text version uh, for them, um, offer candidates the opportunity to answer questions from a phone interview in, in text or email format if they're uncomfortable on the phone and, and if a phone manner is not important to the role, of course. Um, give candidates with uh, with disabilities extra time if they if they request it. Um, or offer it if they've disclosed their disability in the, in the process. Uh, provide an option to interview one-on-one -on -one, um, if that makes your candidate more, feel more comfortable and make them make it more likely that they can bring their best self to the assessment process. And that can be the case with candidates on the uh, autistic spectrum or with severe anxiety, for example. And then finally, make it easy for candidates to request any other reasonable adjustment through the process. And that just goes back to Rachel's point, just ask. It's so it's so important and no one knows their individual circumstances better than the person that's um, that's in the process. And look, these steps aren't designed to give disabled or neurodiverse candidates an unfair advantage. It's just to level the playing field. So just go that extra mile um, and uh, and make it easier to overcome any barriers that they may they may face. So. The final point that I wanted to cover before our Q&A is around how important feedback and reporting is. With, with any of our partnerships, we always set up a candidate survey that allows us to collect anonymous feedback. Um, and that feedback allows us to make incremental improvements and changes as, as we go. And your technology underpinning this, your applicant tracking system, your HRIS should allow you to monitor how successful you are at attracting and assessing and hiring people from different backgrounds. Um, and that will also that should also highlight any stages of the process that that create um, un, un, unfair advantage or, or or disadvantage. So that's really it from me. And we've got we've carved out a little bit of of extra time for a Q and A. Um, Rachel, I had one that um, I jotted down when you were you were talking around um, businesses that are truly inclusive. Uh, and truly disability friendly. And I wonder whether you could give a little bit more context around what you mean by the word truly in there. Well, I, I don't I don't want to sound like I'm being accusatory and, and, and nobody else is, but there obviously we know that legally um every organization is supposed to be um inclusive and and be equal opportunities employers but what we found is the the organizations who really have kind of gone you know what this really does make sense because we've got customer service assistants who are able to speak to uh, our customers who understand the frustration of them having a broken shower or having this that and the other so it's those ones who are really actively promoting what they're doing so John Lewis are a great example of this uh, we've got a case study on our website actually um, they have a young lady called Nicole who really didn't think that she was going to get um, a, a, another job at all but she she actually got her job through even right and what John Lewis have done is they've kind of gone okay well you have this you've, you've, you've got this particular uh, condition so we need to provide this, this and this. And because this lady sometimes has collapses, her colleagues have been trained to help her. And so they are just absolutely really flying the flag. The same with uh, organisations like HS2, who are making sure that their suppliers are all being inclusive as well. So they're 
not only are they are they talking the talk, they're walking the walk and they're taking other, you know, they're bringing other organisations with them. So that's what I mean, the ones who are, they're not just paying lip service and I'm not suggesting that every other company is, um, but some of them are absolute standard bearers, um, you know, and, you know, you look at the organisations that, that, that we're working with and, and there's some really big names there and they are fully embracing it now and it's, it's absolutely brilliant to see. Fantastic. And, and for the smaller businesses, if, uh, for, so if, for example, I'm sure some of the companies on here don't have a huge amount of experience, but mm -hmm. have the have the desire to become a truly in, um, inclusive employer. What would you what would you say are the sort of first steps that that they could take? Well, there are lots and lots of resources out there now. Um, Disability Confidence Scheme, as I have said, there are you know, it's very easy to sign up to be a disability confident committed uh, company, but then you don't actually really have to do anything else after that. But there are loads and loads of free resources. I mean, there's resources on our website. There's just loads and loads of videos, loads of loads of TED Talks. You don't have to make huge, huge, huge changes. I mean, even by can't a massive organisation, we've got 14 team members. Um, but we've, and everybody has lived experience. So what, what we've done is we've, we, we make small changes. We make incremental changes all of the time to help us, I mean, we do consider ourselves to be rather, rather good at it. <laughs> um, and as I said to you earlier, most, a lot of our candidates say, well, I'd really like to come and work for you. Um, but yeah, it's making those small changes and, and actually not trying to make them without having input from disabled candidates and disabled people. Because again, I have an experience of my particular disability that is nothing like somebody else's, that's nothing like, you know, people who've got other impairments. So it's about just starting to, to take those steps and nobody is going to beat you up for getting it wrong if you are trying. I mean, yes, you might get a little bit of a backlash, but if you are, if it comes from a place of good intent and you really are genuinely trying and you are talking to the people who who you want to get involved you know the, the people that you want to attract then you know every journey you know single step and all of that sort of thing there are lots and lots of resources out there and there's lots of organizations that are incredibly generous with their time that will sort of say oh well you know you could do this or you could speak to this person um you know british disability forum's got some fantastic resources as well so it's definitely worth having a look at them and then there's other organizations that will come in and do consultancy for you and help you actually help you on the journey fantastic well thank you very much and it doesn't look like we're getting um any additional questions coming in so i think um i might wrap oh hang on let me just let me just double check. Just got a. I know it's been a thank you, not a question. <laughs> so uh, oh, thank you I, very much, Laura. <laughs> that, so that's that's it from uh, from us. And another massive thanks to you, Rachel, for for joining us today and a really really interesting, really interesting uh, no thought provoking thought provoking talk. And uh, to everyone who joined today, thanks for joining. Um, hope to see you next time. We've got that four four webinars coming up. The the first uh, specific to diversity and investment management. So any of you funds out there, come and uh, come and join us for that. And then we're looking around uh, remote working and what that means for for HR. On the third of December, on the fourth uh, on the tenth of December, we're looking at how companies can hire for potential uh, rather than looking at experience. So very relevant for the conversation we've had today and then on the 15th we're looking at the role of culture and values in a remote workplace so looking forward to seeing um, some of you at, at that one and have a fantastic rest of your week thanks again for joining thank you very much indeed